a lot of firsts involved, some lasts and some firsts. And as a, as a church body, we want to gather around them and celebrate with them. They have accomplished some great things, and we want to, to celebrate as a family. We talk about First Baptist Church, and we talk about faith, family, and finding. We're not just talking about family as mom, dad, and kids. We're talking about that we are all part of this family. And when something great happens in your life, we want to come around and celebrate that with you. Whether it's the birth of a grandchild or the graduation that you've been, been waiting for and hoping for for so long, we want to celebrate with you. Along with these firsts and lasts, we, we know that, that there can be this, this overwhelming kind of fear of those, those new things that are on the horizon. For our college grad, for our high school graduates, maybe it's that, that fear of recognizing that, that pretty soon you're going to be further al- away from mom and dad, and you won't necessarily have them to lean on in the same way that you have before, and, and realize that you're actually going to have to figure out how to cook something from time to time, and uh, whether that's heating something up in the microwave, or, or actually cooking something, or you're going to have to t- t- take care of your, your finances in a way that you never did before. Maybe all that's a little bit intimidating, a little bit scary, and maybe it's more scary for mom and dad than it is for you, <laughs> as you experience them, these firsts and lasts. As I think about this idea of experiencing new things, the thing is this, Starting something new is hard. It just always is. When we start a new position at work, when we take on some new, uh, new responsibility, when you become a parent for the first time, when you graduate, there's something scary about that next thing, about those, those new things coming our way. And the thing is, I, I've noticed that as we get older, we're a little bit more reluctant to those new experiences in our life. We have a tendency to kind of shy away from from trying something new, and we just kind of stick with what we know. Sometimes we get into a little bit of a rut with our lives. Maybe some of you are there right now, you would acknowledge, you know, I'm kind of in the same rut. We have the same things for dinner every week, and we we go to the same places every week, and we we hang out with the same people every week, and we we go to the same vacation spots every year, and we're just kind of in this rut. It's hard for us to give ourselves permission to do something new sometimes. If you have your Bible or you have an app, we're going to be in the book of John, the Gospel of John, John chapter 6. And we're talking about this idea of joyful giver, uh, being a joyful giver, and particularly today we're talking about generosity. And as I was thinking through this idea of generosity within this framework of giving, so many times we think, just our, our minds just immediately go towards money, Right? When we we think about generosity, when we think about giving, uh, that's kind of where our our minds just just immediately go to, our finances. And while finances are certainly a part of this, and we don't want to to overlook that or not talk about that because it's biblical and scriptural, we, we don't want to overlook it. At the same time, there's so much more to being a joyful giver and so much more to generosity than our finances. If we just think about finances when we talk about being generous, then we're going to miss out. See, we want to be followers of Christ, and Christ was an incredibly generous person. Generosity changes how we view the world. And while generosity isn't only about finances, it is about stewardship. As we look at this idea of of generously stewarding the resources that God has given us so that we can benefit somebody else, It's not stewarding it and holding it up and and investing it so that when we retire or so that when our kids go to college or so that when then we have it, but so that we can be a blessing to others, so that we can use those, those gifts to be generous to other people, to be a good steward of the things that God has given us. And generosity always costs there's a cost to being generous. If, if you're talking about finances, there's a, there's a cost to that. But there's a cost to being generous with our time. And there's a cost to being generous uh, with our, our words of appreciation. There's a cost to being generous. There's always going to be a cost associated with generosity. 
Here's the thing, there's a cost to discipleship as well. There's a cost to it. And in this passage in John chapter 6, we're going to see that, that Jesus saw this incredible moment as an opportunity for some discipleship, but there was going to be some cost involved with it. This is what I want you to do for just a second, if you'll, if you'll play with me. Uh, I want you uh, to turn to the person next to you or, or somebody beside you or behind you or in front of you, and, and, and at the count of three, we're all going to say the same thing, all right? We're going to say the same thing to the same person or somebody around you. I want you to simply tell them, I want you to grow. Can we do that? Turn to the person next to you. Three, two, one. I want you to grow. I want you to grow. See, I, I believe that. I believe that, that you want the person beside you, the person in front of you. I, I truly believe that you want the person around you to grow in discipleship fashion. You know, not, not necessarily, you know, some of us have other issues. But, but you want them to grow. I mean, I want my kids to grow in their faith. And I want our students to grow in their faith. And I want our leaders to be growing in their faith. And I want our pastoral staff to be growing in their faith. I want us to be growing. And I think that you want the person beside you to be growing. And I think that you want to be growing. But sometimes it's hard to give permission to ourselves to grow a little bit. Sometimes it's hard to give that person beside you the permission to do something different or new. Some of you have been married longer than I've been alive. And it's, it's hard to give permission to your spouse to become something more, to, to give them permission to try something new. But within the church, wouldn't it be awesome if we were to simply give one another permission to try something new, to grow out of who we currently are, to allow God to use us in unique and different ways? In John chapter 6, verses 1 through 14, this is a unique miracle that's happening here. There, this is the only miracle outside the resurrection of Jesus Christ that is recorded in all four of the Gospels. The only one. There's something powerful about this moment for the disciples themselves. There was something powerful enough that they decide that when they tell the story of Jesus, no matter what, they have to include this story and the resurrection. They, they were like, like, no matter what we say, we've got to talk about this and the resurrection. And for most of us, if you've grow, grown up in church the way that I grew up in church, we kind of view this as a little kid story. Some of you remember seeing this as a flannel graph, right? You remember, you know, you remember kind of, kind of, kind of pulling this together and, and learning about it in Sunday school. And we kind of think about it as a little kid's message. But there's something really important going on here, and I hope that we don't miss it. So we're going to read through this passage, and I want you to put on your, your generous ears and eyes. As we read through it, look for these opportunities of generosity in John chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. It says this, After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. we got to kind of stop there for a second because this is a weird place to pick up a story, right? John kind of, kind of jumps into this a little bit differently than the other three gospel writers. He says, after this. And so there's something tied before this that we need to have some understanding of before we go much further. And it's, it's interesting to see that for John, John is more interested in tying together some things theological ideas, because there's this big gap between what happens in John chapter 5 and John chapter 6. There's a gap of several months that take place, but John is trying to pull together some theological ideas that the other three gospel writers, well, they were more concerned with talking about the chronological order of Jesus's life. The other three gospel writers tells us that right before this, like literally right before this moment, that Jesus had found out that John the Baptist had been killed. Like, like he just found out. A lot of you have gone through uh, a loss and you know that moment when you're told for the, the first time that that person is gone. 
And the amount of emotion, even, even when you know that person is a believer, right? When we know that person is a believer, we know that they are in Christ, we know that they are gonna spend eternity with Christ, there's still such a, a powerful moment. That, that sense of loss and sadness. We don't want to discount the humanity of Jesus here. When Jesus hears of the death of John the Baptist, I think that that's exactly what he's feeling. He's feeling the wind knocked out of him. He's feeling weak. He's feeling vulnerable. He's feeling sad. And he just wants a moment to get away from everybody and have some time with God, his Father, and just some time of solitude, just to process what's going on. After that, Jesus crosses over to the other side of the the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was gathered, was, was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. So there's this large group that is following after him. I can just imagine what Jesus is thinking. He's on this boat. He's going over this, this small sliver of the Sea of Galilee uh, to get to, to kind of this remote place. And everybody starts watching him. They're like, oh, there he goes. Hey, we can get over there. We, we can get there by foot. Let's go, let's go after Jesus. And Jesus has just enough time to get off the boat and start walking up the mountain. And he looks down and here comes the crowd again. <laughs> I can just imagine that. Oh. Moms, you know that feeling, right? You get everything settled, you get everything done, then here comes the kid out of bed again. You're like, oh, I just want a moment. I, I just need a little time. He sees this crowd coming at them. And Jesus has such a generous spirit about him, that he doesn't look at it and says, hey, give me five minutes. <laughs> hey, why don't you people go stand over there? Uh, Peter, why don't you go talk to them? I'm going to go up a little bit. Now, Jesus sees this group coming at him, and he has compassion. He has compassion on them. This generosity of Jesus leads him to this place of compassion on the crowd. In fact, Mark 6 tells us exactly that he was moved by compassion. It was his generousness. It was his compassion. It was his mercy. It was his grace. It was all these things wrapped up into one as he sees this crowd, and he has compassion on them. See, when we're living our life like Christ, and we become people of generosity the way that Christ is generous, we recognize that generosity takes our focus off of ourselves and it puts it on other people. Jesus didn't have a dime, right? He, he didn't have any money to give people, but he was generous. He was generous in his time and he was generous in providing for their needs. And in that moment where it would have been totally reasonable for Jesus to have just said, I, I'm done for the day. Jesus looked at them, looked at the crowd, and he had compassion. And this generosity put the focus on them instead of himself. Beyond having this, this generous view towards the people around him, Jesus sees this happening, and the way that John puts it is a little bit unique. He adds some details to the story that the other three gospel writers don't have. And it says this in chapter, in verse 5, chapter 6, verse 5, lifting up his eyes then, and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Pastor David told you that this is, this is often told as the, the, the feeding of the 5,000. But the text also tells us that's 5,000 men. So it's 5,000 men, plus women, plus children. It could easily be fifteen to 20,000 people in this crowd. And Jesus, in that moment, 
has a generosity towards Philip and to the other disciples. I think that this is why it was so heavy on their hearts. It was so important to them that, that in this moment when Jesus, Jesus could have just said, okay, fine, uh, food. You know, he could have just said the words and there could have been food. In this moment, instead of just acting, he decided to put his arm around Philip and bring him underneath him and say, hey, Philip, what you gonna do about this? <laughs> There's all these hungry people. What, what's your plan here, buddy? I don't know why he singled out Philip. There's, there's a lot of, of, of authors and commentators that, that have different ideas and different theories and different opinions of why Philip over the other ones. Nobody knows, right? The same reason, why is it that God sometimes puts his arm around you and says, hey, have you considered doing this? Hey, have, have you considered reaching out to that person? Hey, have you considered making that phone call? Why you? I don't know. Because God is gracious and he wants to include you in what he's doing. And Jesus, with his, this eye towards being gracious, puts his arm around Philip and includes him in this process. Says, hey, how are we going to feed all these people? And I love Philip's response, which is, is very real. He says, we can't do it. That's the basic line. It can't be done. It, it doesn't matter how much money we have, we can't feed all these people. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to give a, get a little. But Matthew says that it, it would cost more than, than eight months wages is the way that that Matthew writes it down. So if, if we had eight months of salary, we still couldn't give everybody even a little taste. So his basic answer is the same type of basic answer that we give God sometimes when he comes alongside us and says, why don't you do this? Our answer is, I can't. <laughs> I have no idea how to do that. But Jesus included others in what he was doing. Uh, those of you that are graduating, those of you that are ending up school but still have some time to go, you've been through a lot of testing over the past several weeks. I know that, uh, I know that in our own home with our kids, they've been through a lot of testing and final exams. And for those of you graduating out of college, you've been through a lot. And the fact that you can still uh, think clear enough to be here today and put on clothes is amazing, right? Like, like, like they, they, you can think clearly enough to do that, that, that probably both your shoes match and everything. Like, like, that's amazing. We've all been there. Those of us who have been through college, we, we know how stressful that can be. And we don't really like this word test, but that's exactly what, what, God, what Jesus is doing in the life of Philip. See, the text tells us that he puts his arm around him. He talks to Philip. He says, what are we going to do about all this? And the text says that he, he asked Philip to test him, but that Jesus already knew what he was going to do. But he's testing Philip. See, a lot of times when we think about this word test, we normally think about this, this kind of scary moment where we have to go in and do our best and hopefully pass. We don't really think about tests in a very positive light in our culture. We don't like them. We don't like, we, we don't like medical tests. We don't like to be tested in any way. We don't like our patients to be tested. We don't like tests. But this is a moment Jesus looks at this and he realizes that every moment is a discipleship moment. Every moment is a discipleship moment. And he reaches out to, to Philip and he gives him this test of discipleship. Do you trust me? Have you been with me long enough to know what I'm about? See, this isn't a, a pass-fail kind of test. This is a test to, so that Philip can find out and know what he knows. So that Philip can look at himself and say, I know what I know. I know that you are God. I know that you are provider. I know that you can do this. I know that you can do the miraculous. It wasn't about pass or fail. It was about discipleship. And while it wasn't about a pass or fail, it was still the wrong answer. <laughs> His answer was, it can't be done. 
it's impossible. And he was half right. Like, like he's half right. You're right. It, it can't be done. Now just say the rest of it. But Jesus with you, anything is possible. Like, like that, that's all he had to say. But he just looks at it and he's overwhelmed. He says, I, I, I can't do it. It can't be done. Andrew is evidently nearby. In, in the other three Gospels, it says that, that Jesus kind of posed a question to, to the entire disciple group and, and asked them, hey, go, go see what we have. The way that John records it is just Andrew just kind of seems to take it upon himself and goes, hey, he threw out the question. I'll see what I can do. And he comes to Jesus and he looks and he says, I, I have this boy. He's got some food. One of his disciples, Andrew, verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they for so many? Again, he was so close. He was so close to having the right answer. I've got this boy. He's got some stuff. But, but what, can we, what can we do with that? <laughs> it's, it's not enough. I think a lot of us kind of suffer with the same type of, of, of thinking about ourselves. That we, we look at ourselves and we think, God, I don't have the right amount of skill. I don't have the right amount of education. I don't have the right spiritual gifts. I don't have the right the right personality type. I can't be used by you. Do you know how many people said that all throughout Scripture? <laughs> I'm not the right person. You can't use me. I told you earlier that John is, is trying to pull together some theological concepts. In John chapter 5, uh, he, Jesus was, was having this, this argument, this discussion about, about Moses. And what John is trying to do here is tie together the stories of Moses and Jesus in a really unique way. And when God came alongside Moses and tapped him on the shoulder by sending a, a burning bush and say, hey, you're going to be my guy, his response was, not me. <laughs> you got the wrong dude. Uh, you don't know me very well, God, if you think that I can do this. I, I, don't, I don't speak really well. I get kind of nervous in front of people. I, I don't have the right temperament for it. I mean, I, I, I killed a guy. I get, I get kind, of, kind of angry at times. All throughout Scripture, people that thought that they didn't have the right stuff to be used by God, and yet God puts his, their, his arm around them and says, yeah, you, what are you going to do about this? What are you going to do about it? Andrew was so close to having the right answer. But he looks at the bread and he looks at the fish and he goes, it's insufficient. It, it's, it's ordinary. The bread itself, John is the only one of the gospel writers to tell us that it is a particular kind of bread. And he says that's barley bread. And barley bread was this, this bread that was, was just kind of common every day, almost kind of food for the poor. It wasn't a high quality nutritional bread. It was more of filler. And Andrew is looking at he's like, we got this, this kind of filler bread and two pieces of fish. We got this ordinary mundane bread. And we got a little bit of fish. And either way, it's insufficient. And we think about ourselves in very similar terms sometimes. I'm just an ordinary person. I don't have the, what it takes. And, and even if I had some of what it takes, I, I'm insufficient to be used by God. When we think about this idea of being generous and generosity, we recognize that God can take the mundane and he can take the ins insufficient and he can do something radical with it because numbers don't matter when God is the multiplier. All throughout scripture, numbers don't matter when God is the multiplier. It never mattered before. It doesn't matter at this story and it doesn't matter in our lives today. It doesn't matter the numbers when God is involved with it. 
It doesn't matter your giftedness or your natural bent. I mean, I love studying those types of things. I love doing those personality tests and finding out if, I, if I'm, I'm a beaver or golden retriever or if, I, you know, if I'm an ENTJ or, or ENTP or you know, all those types of things. I love doing those types of things. I, I, it gives you so much insight into yourself and into your spouse and into your kids when you do that type of thing. It's so great. But you know what I see all throughout Scripture? God looking at our personality types, God looking at our skill set and saying, I don't care about those I'm calling you to do something that's outside of your comfort zone, baby. Just get out and do it. Don't you know who I am? Trust me. All throughout Scripture. Numbers don't matter when God is the multiplier. See, earlier you looked to the person around you and you told them that you want them to grow. I believe you. Growth is a part of discipleship, and growth, I, I've never seen anybody grow firmer in their faith without serving, without getting involved. I, I've been in youth ministry a, a long time, and, and over and over and over again, I get kind of the, some of the same questions a lot from students. And part of that same question that I get is, uh, is I don't feel like I'm growing in my, my faith. I don't, I don't feel like I'm, I'm getting enough meat. I don't feel like I'm getting enough. What can I do? And almost every time I can look at that person and I say, how are you serving? And their answer is usually, I'm not. <laughs> if you're not serving, you're not growing. I can guarantee you that. If you're not serving, you're not growing. If you're not being generous with your time, if you're not being generous with your talents, if you're not being generous with your ability, if you're not being generous with the things that God has given to you, you're not growing. But what if we really gave permission to one another to grow? What if we really gave permission to one another to do something different and and maybe a little bit scary? What if we truly gave each other the permission to try something new? It could cost you some time, it could cost you some preference. Oh, what, if, what if next week you decide to sit someplace new just so you could get to know people on the other side? And what if somebody from over there comes over here and they sit in your seat? Would you, would you be gracious enough and generous enough to allow that to happen? What if, what if, what if you decided that you really want to be part of the of the welcome team, and you've never done anything like that before. And, and so you, you, you contact Pastor Mike, you say, I want to be part of the welcome team, and, and he starts putting you to work. And, and what if you come to the door one day, and that person uh, seems to be busy doing something else that they don't get quite right? <laughs> See, the thing is, when we try something new, sometimes we're not great at it immediately. I think that's one of the reasons why we as adults, we have this tendency to kind of steer away from doing something new, because we don't want to look foolish. We don't want to look like we don't know what we're doing. About the only time that we ever recognize the folks up in the sound booth is when something goes wrong, right? <laughs> like, like, like 95% of the time, we don't recognize any of those people because it's going right. It's those little times when something goes wrong that we look at, oh. But what if we gave permission for somebody who's never done something like that before to give it a shot? It may not be perfect immediately, but what if we gave them permission to try? Jesus sees Philip and he sees Andrew. Philip has this just overwhelming sense of, I can't do it. Andrew looks at it and says, says well, we, it's insufficient. What I have isn't enough. But ultimately, all this came from this, this boy. Oddly, John is the only one to mention the boy. The other three gospel writers don't mention this boy at all. But Andrew, he looks around, he says, this is what we have. There's this boy here, and he's got this bread, and he's got this fish. And this boy demonstrates incredible generosity. He gives up what he has. And God takes that, and he multiplies it, and he uses it. This boy, he joyfully exchanged all that he had for all that Christ is. 
He took the bread. He took the, the fish that he had, all that he had, and exchanged it. But here's this really cool thing. In the text, it says that, that everybody there, so Jesus takes this bread, he takes the fish, and he takes the bread, and he, he blesses it, and then he breaks it, and then he gives it to the disciples, and the disciples go and they pass it out. And he does the same thing with the fish. He takes it, and he blesses it, and he breaks it, and they pass it out. And everybody there, the fifteen to 20,000 people there, ate until they were full. And then when they were done, there were 12 baskets left over. I think that when you see something like that, you don't forget it. <laughs> I think that when you witness something like that, you don't go away going, wow, that was cool. I think you go away changed. It changes the way that you view the world. It changes the way you view yourself. It changes the way that you view God. And this little boy is part of that group that got to eat all that he wanted and was full. See, we, we sometimes think about this little boy as he gave something up but the reality is he gave something up, but he got so much more back. He got to eat till he was full as well. When we give all we have to God, we're never empty. We're never empty when we give all that we get, have to God. Particularly to our high school graduates, I want to encourage you to be people of generosity. To be generous with the resources that God has given you. To be generous with the time and the talents and the opportunities that you have. To be generous to the people around you. Jesus was a person of incredible generosity. He had generosity towards the crowd. And he met the need. He had generosity in bringing the disciples around with him. And recognizing that every moment is a discipleship moment. And having this opportunity to speak into the lives of the, the, the disciples. And bring them into this situation. Was incredibly gracious with his time. And this little boy was incredibly gracious by giving up all that he had. But he didn't go away empty. He gave it all, but he wasn't empty. See, generosity changes the way we view the world. It changes the way that we view others. And it changes the way that we view ourselves. Sometimes it's easier to be generous with the person beside you than it is with yourself. To generously allow yourself to grow by serving in a way that you've never done before. To generously do something that you've never thought that you would have the nerve to do. And while it's easy for us to think about things inside the church, what if it's something as simple as going to that neighbor that you've lived beside for five years and never talked to? <laughs> Anybody have one of those? <laughs> That neighbor, that maybe they're three doors down. You see them come and go, but you've never actually talked to them. And, you, and maybe this is the week that you finally bake a cake or some cookies and take it to them and just introduce yourself and be like, I am so sorry, this is awkward. We've been living by each other for five years and we don't even know each other. I just thought there was time that we got past that. <laughs> or maybe, maybe you look at somebody that you work with and and instead of just overlooking them, you, you invite them over to your home sometime and you have a conversation with them with, about something other than work. And you get to know them. You get to know their, their life. And you get to speak Christ into their lives. To be generous with your time and with your resources. Or maybe, students, you get the number of, of, of a classmate that you've, you've had some interactions with, but, but you're not really friends with, but you get their phone number, you text them, and you, and you invite them to go see a movie with you. Or, or you go to church. Would you come to church with me? What if we were generous with our time, generous in pouring that into other people's lives? What if we allowed one another to be generous in that type of way? That we truly looked at the gifts that we had and the opportunities that we have and we we say to God, all that I have is yours. All that I have is yours and you can do with it whatever you want. I want to be a person of great generosity. I want to be a person that, that allows you to work in me. I want to be the person that, that gives of the resources that I have. Maybe God has been pressing on you to, to try to do something new inside the church and something that would be a blessing to, to us and to one another, or maybe it's something in your own home. For some of you, you've been, you've been hearing us talk about this idea of, of 
of living out your faith within your family, and you know that you should start having some type of devotional life with your spouse, but you've just, you can't figure out how to, to do that without feeling weird or awkward. What if you gave yourselves the permission for it to feel weird and awkward for a little bit? <laughs> and you start having some time together as husband and wife, praying together and reading the scripture together. Could it be weird and awkward at first? Yeah, it could. Is it possible that you may not do it well at first because you kind of fumble it? Yeah, it's possible. But what if you were generous enough with one another that said, it doesn't matter, we're trying, we're doing it. What if we were generous enough to allow God to shape us and to change us by doing something new?